Hello, everyone, and welcome uh, for joining us today on this webinar uh, and for joining us to celebrate Hispanic Heritage uh, Alumni event, uh, the Identity Talk uh, this afternoon, brought to you by the Offices of Career uh, Solutions and Corporate Engagement, the Office of Inclusion and Diversity Engagement, and the Office of Development and Alumni Relations. My name is Nick Alico, and I'm a senior studying human centered design and development, and I'll be one of your moderators today. It's important that we take a moment and actually know why we're here today. So we're doing this session as part of the Hispanic Heritage Month, which actually begins today if you want to wear it. Um, this event is celebrated nationally to honor the cultures and contributions of the Hispano and Hispanic and Latino Americans to the history, culture, and achievements of the United States. We will begin our program in a few moments. Hi, I'm Nikki Agarwal. I'm a co-moderator today for today's Alumni Identity Talk. I'm a junior studying data sciences. And before we begin, I'd like to mention that we are recording this session today. Um, now let's meet the panelists. First, we have Noel Claudio, 2014 graduate of IST and currently strategy and operations analyst with Twitter. Next, we have Diana Long, 2004 graduate of IST, currently Director and Program Manager at General Atlantic. Also on our panel today is Jackie Sanchez, 2019 IST grad and a technology risk consultant with a big four firm. Welcome everyone and thank you for being part of such an amazing panel. If you could each share a little bit more about yourself and then we'll start off with some questions. Noelle, you can start off. Sure. Uh so I want to first say thank you to the College of IST, to all of you here today, the panelists, everyone for uh, making this event happen, especially uh, during a very important time um, as Hispanic and Latinx Heritage Month is. Um, my name is Noel Claudio. I am originally from uh, Puerto Rico y República Dominicana, Dominican Republic. I grown up in Philly for my entire life. I attended uh, Penn State from 2010 to 2014, obviously IST major, which I love, so big shout out to this college. Um, and uh, my career has been, in, a, in many different ways, started out with consulting for five and a half years with, uh, with Deloitte, then a year with Slalom, and then about six months ago, I uh, started a new position in strategy and ops for Twitter's platform and engineering team. Um, I love Marvel, I love basketball, I'm a big sports fan, I'm everything Philly. Uh, but more importantly, I, I'm just looking forward to have this discussion here today with everyone on um, all of our experiences and, and just what that meant to us, um, and especially as how that relates to today's corporate world and inclusion and diversity. Uh, Jackie, you can go next. Hi everyone, I'm Jackie Sanchez. Um, I graduated from Penn State in 2019, as was mentioned before. Um, I majored in security and risk analysis with a focus in cybersecurity. I don't think that's I don't think that's a major anymore. Um, and I also minored in IST and psychological sciences. Um, I'm a technology risk consultant senior at a big four accounting firm. Um, I do primarily the IT audit side of financial reporting um, for work. I do also some other consulting work, but that's my primary kind of focus there. Um, outside of work, I do enjoy spending time with my family, especially my puppy, my puppy Kefla. She's super cute. Um, I rescued her at the end of January, and I also like to foster adoptable dogs. Um, I'm definitely looking forward to sharing all of my thoughts with you today. And then Diana. Hello, uh, Diana Long. I graduated in 2004. And I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York, and um, my cultural background, my family's from Guatemala, and um, I'm currently a director at General Atlantic. I'm overseeing the entire IT project portfolio, but before that, I went through a few different roles. Um, I started my career off as a quality assurance software tester and moved all the way through being a test lead. Then I operated in a combined role at Vanguard, which is a financial services company, um, as a business analyst working from general uh, requirement gathering all the way through corporate strategy and helping create the projects that would help support that corporate strategy. Um, the most interesting part about my career so far is I did a year and a half stint in Australia supporting the company. So that was pretty exciting. 
And um, so then I ended up moving back home to New York. I was married and now I have two kids, a six-year-old and a four-year-old. And in my spare time, um, I did launch my own beauty product, right? A nail polish. But with all that, I was able to use all of my IT skill sets in uh, creating a product launch. Um, now I'm a product manager all the way through creating the e-commerce site. And I'm currently working on a program um, to help train women specifically in becoming uh, QA testers and help them break into IT. So I look forward um, to launching that, that program. Awesome. Well, thank you all three of you for sharing a little bit about yourselves, giving us some context for um, what we're about to talk to us uh, today. So thank you. Um, and thank you for sharing your incredible accomplishments as well. That's really helpful. Um, just some quick housekeeping notes for our webinar audience. If you have any questions for the panelists, please use the Q&A box. There should be a, a button at the bottom. We'll be checking that regularly and we'll delineate questions to the best of our ability. Um, now we'll jump into our first question. Um, so to all the panelists or, um, and the uh, people today, uh, who are some of your role models or inspirations in technology or in your specific field or community? Um, Diana, if you have anything, we can start with you. Sure. Um, I don't think I've ever had just one in my career. Um, surprisingly enough, even very early in my career, right back in 2004, uh, I was exposed to pretty senior women. And that's just, just been, and, and when I mean that, I mean they, they had been doing the job already for 25 years, right? And they really took the time to mentor me. And I, I, I do appreciate that. Um, and I would say more recently, um, my mentor, she was the um, CIO at the previous CIO at the company I'm, I'm at now. And that's who I started under. But it was just unheard of for me to know a woman CIO and especially at a financial firm. And so she's been a mentor to me as well. So, you know, just the, the women that I have come across and to know that um, Casey was, you know, Latina as well, that was that was pretty um, inspiring to me to know that like, all right, there's space, there's definitely still space for us, you know, in the industry. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Um, Jackie, do you have any uh, ideas on that? Yeah, so I guess I'll go with more of like the community aspect. Um, my biggest role models, not necessarily in technology, but more so just in life would definitely be kind of like my family. So my father, my brother and my sister mainly. Um, I say not mainly technology because my brother is also a technology professional. So I guess he counts in that sense. Um, but anyways, um, so they're my biggest role models just because, um, you know, my dad came over from El Salvador with basically just the clothes on his back. He didn't have anything else with him. He didn't speak the language. Um, so just the fact that he was able to overcome that and, you know, see all of his children grow up and be successful, um, that has really just given me the motivation to persevere and also be successful. Um, kind of the same thing with my brother, right? He was first generation out of all of us going to college. Um, he had to kind of be the one to figure out the application process. My parents didn't go to college, so they didn't understand that at all. Um, and then like lastly, my sister. So when she graduated from college, she just kind of decided to go into the Marines, um, which was a big surprise to us all. And just the fact that she's been able to accomplish and make such a successful career out of that has really just been very inspirational for me. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Noelle, what uh, info do you have on your role models? I share a very uh, similar story as, as Jackie just mentioned. I, I don't necessarily have a role model that I grew up with or looked up to in terms of some high profile person or celebrity, et cetera, or CEO. Um, mine was more so um, family members who just edged me on throughout the entire process. So just like uh, Jackie mentioned, and many of us actually in the Latinx community, um, I'm also a first gen graduate, so I, I didn't have my, my mom was a stay at home mom. My dad worked in landscaping. No one worked in tech at all within my family. So um, I had no one to necessarily look up to in terms of technology and what that would be or where my career would go. But I always held myself to talk to mentors, coaches, people that were even just your a manager, senior manager it doesn't have to be some high profile celebrity, but like someone that I can relate to and can tell me that I have a bright career if I do these things early on, 
um, in the consulting world, I learned a ton and I got to meet so many people and work with so many clients and so many uh, different situations that I think that set me up for um, long-term success to, to where I'm in right now. So um, it's, it's a struggle for, for many of us within the Latinx community, but um, it's also what makes us who we are. Great, thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it. Nikki? Um, yeah, so second question. Um, what was your biggest obstacle or challenge that you faced in your time as a student at Penn State? Um, Jackie, do you wanna go first? Yeah, I can start. Um, so thinking about my biggest obstacle while I was a student at Penn State was probably just kind of like the ability to believe in myself and believe that, you know, I can accomplish what I set my mind to. Um, so for instance, I remember freshman year, first semester, I had to drop a class and I was completely devastated. Um, so that was always just something that kind of stuck with me. I called my brother like almost in tears and he was like, it's fine. Like you're going to be okay. <laughs> it happens. It's not a big deal. Um, and then another instance that comes to my mind that really just kind of like stuck with me throughout my college career and even now was having um, one of my male peers tell me in a coding class that I should probably switch majors to like a liberal arts major because um, he had taken a coding class in high school and this was my first time coding so I wasn't you know picking it up as quickly as he was so just like those types of moments have really stuck with me and and kind of like made me doubt myself, um, but also kind of motivated me in the sense. So, you know, just kind of using those types of pressures to to really motivate yourself was probably um, kind of a challenge I faced. Thank you. Um, Diana? Sure. So very similar to Jackie and what Noelle said, um, there was no one in my family that knew anything about technology or anything having to do about technology. I actually went in undecided. And so my first challenge was trying to figure out what I wanted to do at Penn State. And I took, you know, the intro to IST and I knew that this was it for me. And then even with the circle of friends that I had formed at Penn State at the time, still no one knew anything about technology. You know, it was a new major and no one had any sort of technical experience. Um, and I remember uh, just recently reminiscing on this, I was actually the first member of my sorority, Sigma Lambda Gamma National Sorority, to um, be part of the School of IST, and they really helped me overcome that challenge, even though they weren't part of it, but when I was in the computer lab, they would bring me food, you know, when I needed a nap and they were on campus, like, they were there, and then also within the School of IST, um, it was also, Jackie, my first time doing any sort of coding, which of course I did not pick up right away because I was not trained in high school, but I did find um, my, my small group of guys. Because at the time, I don't think I saw another um, woman in IST until my senior capstone class in any of my classes. They might've been one here or there. Um, so the guys also took care of me, you know, and, and tutoring me and making sure that, you know, I, I got through the classes, but you know, just not having that generational knowledge or being exposed to anything having to do with IT was um, was very was very challenging. Thank you for sharing. Um, Noel, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I think uh, for me, and it's it's actually crazy hearing that um, because you see the gap from two thousand four to two thousand fourteen. Some things change, but you know, it's a process. Other things, you know, it still has to be worked upon. And I think for IST, it when I started, I actually began at a branch campus. I was at Penn State Abington for my first two years before I transferred. So my perspective of U Park was a little bit different as a transfer student. I didn't have all the friends. I didn't have everyone connected with me and such. I left a lot of people behind um, over here in the Philly area and Abington area. And um, I do remember when I transferred initially that um, I had one, one professor who was basically very against me transferring, of course, and then uh, tried to talk me out of it by saying that I would basically not find any job opportunities. It was way too big of a campus and all types of stuff out there. Um, and of course, this professor was white, so it didn't help that cause either um, as, as a minority um, heading over there. But nevertheless, that's something that, you know, we, we all go through and we still strive to be better um, and, and motivates us. So when I went to U Park, a lot of my classes there immediately, 
my entire IST uh, curriculum was mainly more men than women. And that was like very disappointing, but it's also not just reflective of just IST at Penn State. It's also the industry. There's a lot of like in corporate America where there's more men than women in engineering and in tech. And that's something we're like constantly changing at every single point in there. Um, but I, I just, for me, it was just, I didn't have the friends. I didn't have the network and the connections. So it, we're at a disadvantage, right? You're already going to a school, you're a minority. There's not a lot of people like you. There's not a lot of people who've been there and have had the same exact struggles. And on top of that, you don't possess a network. There are no uncles and grandfathers and cousins or anyone that um, are partners at a company or work here and there to connect you. So I had to do a lot of freestyling and learn on my own. Uh, but I regret nothing because it led me to who I am and, and what I've done today. Thank you all for sharing. Um, Nick? Sure. Uh, we'll actually uh, toss this back to Noel first and then we'll allow the other uh, panelists to jump in. Um, Noel, was there a time during your career or life that really stands out to you? um as uh, like an uncertain time yeah i you know for me it was more personal than it was necessarily professional i think going back to what i, I just previously mentioned the decision to transfer and leave behind the small group of network and people i had at a branch campus to go over to main campus was really really big for me um, there is a lot of people in the Latinx community are also, we're very family oriented, right? Like it's super, like it, it, every decision we make is based upon our family. And sometimes our family doesn't even want us to go to school because they want us to be in the house or they want us to be doing something else. And, and that's a big gap, right? Generational gap. Uh, so it was hard for me in 2012 to, to make the decision to move to Penn State, Maine, because at that time, um, I unfortunately had lost my father um, and he recently passed away and I was in the midst of transferring and I had to leave behind my mom and my younger brother, but um, I still did it. And I did it because I had faith and I knew that I would get opportunities at Penn State, Maine. I knew that all the top companies would go there. And I also understood that I had good grades and I can keep it up and continue to more so expand my network. Uh, diversity and inclusion was huge. I know it's gotten to an even better point today than it was you know, 10 years ago, um, but it was tough. It was very, very tough. And, and hopefully I'm hoping that this continues to rise now as as a, we get, we need more, we need more diversity in tech, basically that's, that's enough. <laughs> for sure, no, thank you for sharing that. Um, Diane or Jackie, would you like to contribute anything to that? Feel free to jump in. Sure, um, I would say a time that I was um, most uncertain was my first role um, after graduating, um, actually even during my internship. So I interned for Vanguard, um, and then my first role was trading a bond, was testing a bond trading application. I went to the School of IST. I did not go to the Smeal College of Business. I do not know anything about finance. And at this point, I knew just enough about technology, right, to get me a role. Um, one of the gaps that, I, you know, my family has personally experienced because, you know, I'm a child of immigrants is we don't know anything about the trading or investment or what that world even looks like. So here I am, you know, fresh out of school and I'm like, how am I going to trade this thing that I would test this thing that I don't even know what it is. Um, but, you know, I was up for the challenge and I quickly learned that in technology, right? You don't do technology for the sake of doing technology. You do the technology to help solve a problem or an issue. So um, Vanguard put us through bond school, right? And we had to learn how to, how to do the trading um, so that we can test and try to break the application. And that was just the common theme throughout. Every time I was assigned a new project, I was exposed to a new part of finance, which I had never been exposed to before. But um, I quickly gained that skill set to be able to, to catch up quickly. And that's really what helped differentiate me you know, from my peers. Um, I think having that hunger and being exposed to something for the first time in life you know, was really interesting to me. And, um, and to be able to pass that down to now my children and my friends who are who don't have that exposure has been um has, it's been pretty exciting. Great, um, Jackie, do you have anything you wanted to add? I don't have. Yeah, I don't think I have too much for this um, question here. Okay, no problem. 
Um, let's see, Nikki, did you want to touch on uh, a Q&A question or so? Yeah, um, let's see. Um, do you guys have any advice for current students? And anyone can start. Um, I would say don't wash yourself out. You know, if you are in an interview and you feel like you are too animated or too bold, or maybe you're not extroverted or introverted enough, just truly really be yourself in that interview so that, um, that, that you know, those managers know who they're getting, right? And if they can't value you for who you are, then you shouldn't really be working there anyway. Doesn't matter like what type of reputation they have because you can only fake it for so long. So, yeah, I want to add to that. I think, and I, I love that answer because I think um, one of the things is like just be authentic, right? Come as your authentic self, and that's so big, um, and it shows your personality. For for IST, unless things have changed, I there was always a conflict between are we computer science, are we programmers, are we business, are we in the middle? And for what I've realized is that we really do live in the middle. And a lot of people think that if you have these hard skills, for example, you're really good at programming and doing Java and Python, those things, those are amazing. Those are gonna set you up for success. But what really is the value of IST is also the soft skills that come along with the hard skills. So that means being able to be in front of a room and do a presentation to command, right? To be able to pull together a plan, to be able to execute upon it. A lot of the work that like I've done, I don't necessarily do any coding at all, actually. I understand some of it, but I haven't coded a day in my life in my job. It's all been consulting and now strategy and operations, but I'm not successful if I don't understand technology. I don't understand what implementations are. I don't understand the SDLC cycle and things like that um, or agile methodology. So like all of that is super important. So if you are a person who's like, I love IST, but I don't know if I want to be a programmer or where do I fit? You fit somewhere. You can be a project manager. You can be a program manager, a scrum master. And those are all embedded within tech teams. So my best advice is to work on those soft skills and not just the hard skills as well. Yeah, and I guess just to add on to, you know, what Noelle and Diana had said there, um, soft skills, I think, go much further. I've only been in my career now for a little over two years, but soft skills go much further than, you know, hard skills. The hard skills you can learn on the job, it's the soft skills and polishing those that, you know, really impress employers, especially during interviews and all of that. Um, and also to their point, just, you know, as a current student, I would explore all opportunities and like, you know, different internship positions, different career positions, um, just to piggyback off of Noel, there's so many different um, areas you can go into, you know, there's many different niches within technology. So it's important as a student for you to explore those rather than, you know, doing an internship with the same company and then just accepting the job offer right away. Um, I think it's very important that you consider, you know, your, all of the options that you really do have out there. Um, Nick, if I, if I can add one more thing, right, because as I'm thinking about this panel and um, the context of Hispanic Heritage Month, um, I would say start to get curious now about the people who attend Penn State, right? We have so many cultural groups and programming, and this is really where we can all take initiative, no matter what background you're from, to learn about others. Because once we get in the real world, we can really start to understand um, why people work the way that they are, work the way that they work, or communicate the way that they do. If we just, you know, all take a moment to really um, try to experience different people, I think that would be helpful for you um, professionally as well. Thank you. That is actually some very great advice. Um, Nick, do you want to take the next question? Yeah, I'll pose another uh, Q&A question that sort of goes along that line of questioning. Um, anyone can feel free to jump in, but um, what were some goals that you had for yourself maybe around junior year to ensure that you had a good job lined up? I know we sort of touched on that, but maybe if you could expand on that. 
I can, I can go first. Um, so junior year, a big goal I set for myself was, you know, getting, getting an outside internship um, outside. So my sophomore year, I did um, an internship with Penn State, actually. So I stayed in State College over the summer. But then, you know, I kind of wanted to, again, get that corporate um, experience and that real professional experience. Um, so I did end up doing an internship that summer. I, to be fully honest with you, I did not like what I was doing. It was the same kind of boring technology stuff um, every day in and day out. Um, I was just, you know, part of a, an IT security team. So we were just checking, make sure people's access was appropriate, things along those lines. Um, so that kind of showed me what I didn't, you know, want to go into then, which was definitely helpful. And then um, another goal I had set was kind of more towards senior year, but that was just to get a job offer or hopefully multiple, um, you know, by that, by that fall semester, just so that my spring semester, I didn't have to worry about that at all, or like even after graduation, because I know that's a lot of things um, college seniors kind of struggle with. Um, so those were kind of two goals that I set for myself that, you know, I was hoping to accomplish and ended up accomplishing. Cool. Anyone else want to contribute to that? Yeah, I think um, I'll add real quick, but my, my goal in my junior year was as simple as, you know, be unique and just stand out. Because when you start in your junior year, now all of these, there's pressure. Now all of these companies are coming. You kind of start to see a window. You're just like, I'm about to graduate soon. What am I going to do with my life? All of these questions come to your mind. And then you end up going to career fairs. You've got to prepare for the interview and such. What companies like to look at, and obviously I've been in all of your shoes and I've been on the other side and I remember how I felt, is how do you differentiate yourself from everyone else? And that might be, did you, do you have leadership positions? I mean, if you're hosting, for example, you're hosting panels like this, right? Or you're doing, you're being an advocate for inclusion and diversity, or you're a part of Greek life or something like that, where you can share some leadership exposure, that's already a win, right? Volunteering in the community, that's a win. If you, and to be able to land an exclusive sophomore internship, you are now at an advantage that many juniors starting out in their semester do not have because you have experience that they don't. I was able to land a, a sophomore year internship over in New York, um, and it was nothing to do with my career today, but because of that experience, I was more attractive to Deloitte when I came in than anyone else um, when I was at Penn State, and that led me to ultimately getting an internship offer at the end of my junior year, which then led to my senior year, having a full-time offer signed and being able to just relax the entire senior year, I already know that I was going to start my job there. But it all begins like in your sophomore year towards the end into your junior year. Yeah, I, com I completely agree with Nick. I also did have a sophomore year um, internship. Um, I landed a program through the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities. Uh, where I had a um, technology related, this was a general technology related internship with the Department of Commerce. So I got to see, um, you know, the, the public sector work. And then that landed me my junior year internship at Vanguard. Um, and then from there, it, and my goal there was just to get an internship because I really liked it. I thought it was, it was really interesting um, and working in two totally different capacities. Junior year, for all the points that Noel just said, is because I was very involved um, in extracurriculars, was very busy. Um, and, you know, if you keep what's, I forget what the saying is, but, you know, give your work to the busiest person, right? Because, you know, it'll get done. Um, and so my, my focus was also ensuring that my GPA was where it needed to be, um, because that's really the GPA you start to interview with and, you know, start to look at. So, um, you're juggling a lot of balls, right? And you just got to make sure, you know, which ones are the glass balls that if they break, you know, if they fall and they break, it's a problem or the rubber ball that, you know, it's okay if, if one lets go and it's different for everyone. Yes, thank you all for that perspective. It's really helpful to see your sort of like broader perspective of how you approach that. And I think that all really applies to students today as well. Um, Nikki, did you have uh, an next question? Yeah, I have another Q&A question. Um, can you talk more about how co-curricular activities supported your learning and experience? Um, and anyone can start. I 
I can I can start with this one. Um, so there, I had two pretty key co-curricular activities, which I participated at Penn State, um, and then going back to the point where Noel said that IST really sits in the middle. So I participated um, in um, a Latin American like business association where I became like the president. So it was really interesting because I got to coordinate with a lot of accounting and marketing majors, which I normally wouldn't have. And through that, I was able to use my IT experience to help, you know, create websites for the firm and help create marketing material. Again, other things I could put on my resume selfishly. Um, and then the second organization um, was also my sorority, Sigma Lambda Gamma. Um, through that, just gaining the leadership that I needed, again, to create websites for the firm and help, you know, with all like the graphic design and monitoring um, for marketing. Again, it just really helped me put things that were like nice and, and beefy and chunky on the resume. And because I participated with these groups through many years, um, just creating that support network again uh, was really, really helpful in getting me through all the work and, and initiatives we had going on. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, so I could definitely give a shout out to the Women in IST Club um, at Penn State and specifically, obviously, in the College of IST. Um, that organization was a huge kind of part of my career within the college. Um, I, we had all sorts of events with alum or, you know, just professionals within the field. And that really started, um, you know, to get me networking and also just networking with other kind of, you know, and other minority groups of women in technology. Um, it helped me, you know, just connect with, with other people like me, um, that could kind of understand where, you know, I'm coming from and things along those lines. Um, so that was definitely a big organization that, you know, played, played a part, um, in my college career. Yeah. Um, I mean, really quickly from, from my side, um, I was involved in, in a lot of different things, um, including the you know Greek life Latinx community and such but um, I'm also I think now I do more than I was even doing within Penn State which is crazy and that includes like national organizations like uh, like Alpha Association Latino Professionals for America SHIP um, Tequeria there's there's many nonprofits out there, Latinas in tech, there's a, there's many that are now focused on enhancing diversity and inclusion within the professional workforce, but also they have student chapters at not just Penn State, but all around. So it's a great opportunity to, to get involved in organizations like that, where not only do you have your Penn State community, but you have people in other schools that share the same interests. Um, and oftentimes you'll have uh, even specialized companies that come and recruit at these particular conferences in collaboration with the colleges, uh, which is so awesome to see because it gives a platform for people, especially minorities, to be able to be seen and be heard um, in ways that we haven't in the past. Thank you all. Um, Nick, do you have another question? Yeah, I have one more that sort of um, is alongside this, but sort of shifts the target. So. Um, if anyone can jump in, um, what advice do you have for faculty about creating a supportive and inclusive class environment? So just something that comes to mind right away for me is, and it might seem very minor, but just learning how to actually pronounce people's names, right? Not using like nicknames or initials or something like that, but learning how to pronounce people's names truly. And like, you know, it's fine if you mispronounce that first or whatever, but even now in the professional world, I come, you know, across a lot of names working globally that I'm, you know, not um, familiar with. They don't, they're not, you know, your typical American names. So I just think really taking that time to, to understand where the origin's coming from and things along those lines, like it seems minor, but I think it really goes a long way. Um, I know, you know, a bunch of people really, they don't say anything, but it definitely gets to them. I think when people don't take the time to respect them enough to pronounce their names. Um, pretty minor, but it comes to mind. Yeah, I would say when um, creating any sort of like case studies or projects, um, really push the teams to work um, 
and, and again, it, it just depends on how the, the class is set up and or how big the class is, but really push the teams to get out of their comfort zone and think about um, solutions for different types of groups, right? Throw in a disability there, you know, throw in a case study where you're working in an underrepresented community, um, really challenge the students to really think outside of like the norm and the cookie cutter solutions um, that will only set you up as a professor, you know, to let you know that you are um, really contributing and starting to seed it in students' minds. And it really helps the students really start to think about this, like, okay, this is a real world example that I'm working on. Yeah, I agree with, I agree with all of that. That's exactly like what I, how I would say too. Uh, the only other thing I can add is like, look at some of the best practices that are happening right now. Um, by no means am I or probably anyone here a diversity and inclusion like expert, but uh, we have experiences working in our own BRGs and leadership, and things like that. Uh, what I've seen that works well is like paying attention now to people's pronouns, right? Like how they wanna be identified um, is, is super important. Taking a look at how the teams are built. A lot of times you might say, in a class, especially if it's case studies or a project management related thing, it's like, okay, you form a team, pick your five, but you're, you're going to leave people out that way sometimes as well, because people are going to pick their friends. You might have, you know, mainly all groups of guys, like look at how you can further make sure that there's more even diversity within the teams and the people that are um, working there. If that's to that ability and power that you have, for example, as faculty and professionals, um, and, and embrace what's happening in the IND world too. So not just within IST, but all of Penn State. So if, if that is in the in Greek life community, if that's in the multicultural center, IND office, any events that happen, try to bridge that and bring more people. And then likewise, it will also help to, to start early and trying to recruit people and as freshmen and such right out of high school and however that happens, but finding a way to show them the awesome things that Penn State's doing from an IND perspective to attract more talent. Uh, Penn State main campus is amazing, right? Like we know this, like University Park is awesome, but there are a lot of people in the Latinx community that will still face the same challenges as all of us did at one point. And that's, do I leave home? Am I gonna be able to financially support this? Am I gonna be alone? Am I gonna make friends or not? What does this mean for me? So if, as much as we can answer those questions, um, it would help to attract more people. Great, no, thank you all for sharing that advice. That's really helpful perspective. Um, we're gonna jump into two targeted questions now for one of our two specific panelists. So first I'll direct this question back to Noel. Um, we actually wanna congratulate you because you're recognized as a 40 under 40 Aldea uh, news member honoree. And uh, that's for those of you who aren't aware, it, it highlights and showcases uh, diverse and impactful young professionals across the Philadelphia region. So congratulations on that. Um, and we just want to ask you um, if you could talk about um, like wanting to increase minority representation in tech and how this recognition influences that work. Sure, and, and thank you as well for uh, the support and love. Um, Aldia News is a very prominent uh, news media agency in Philadelphia. Um, supports other regions too, but mainly grown in Philadelphia. And surprisingly, even when I was a kid, I remember getting these old news articles that my parents would like read and it would be through that. So it was, it was really cool for that experience. Um, but you know, it's even more than just a recognition. It's, it's about like the, what you can do now and then how it continues throughout your career as well, even when you leave Penn State. Because a lot of like the thoughts I have are not that different than when I was a student. It's just that now I have a bigger platform, believe it or not, even apart from Penn State with the large alumni network and all these things. Um, it's, it's more that now you have more control, more power. You're a part of these really great companies. And the, this award and, and, and recognition was essentially based on the Philadelphia region uh, for me, which was important because in Philadelphia, a lot of... Um, students, especially of minority representation, grown up just like me, coming right from North Philadelphia in a community where we're first gen, we're first grads, we don't necessarily know where to go, no one's ever done there, been here before, and now you go to school, 
you graduate, you're the first in your family, you get a, an awesome job, hopefully, right? Like now you have a career, but you're progressing in your career. You're finding ways to, to bring more people that were just like you and, and need help and need a voice to come into your companies as well and to also diversify it. I've seen this at Deloitte, I've seen it at Slalom, and it's the same thing at Twitter. It doesn't matter where you go. Every company has challenges. They're all going to have goals, but it is hard. It's very hard to increase representation right now. Um, and the main thing you can do as a student is continue to have your voice, continue to show, continue to want to be a part of things and to embrace your authenticity, but don't forget it when you leave either. Because people will tend to just, I graduated and I'm gone. I'm just going to go work and that's it. And that doesn't get us nowhere. We have to continue after we graduate to be able to still help students, help the younger generation, and as well as, as help yourself. If I'm, I'm young, I'm 29 years old, but I don't know everything. I still sometimes look up to mentors as well who are senior managers at companies and such. And I, I seek for help and advice there. So it's always a cycle that will continue. Great, thank you for that info. That's wonderful advice, so thank you. Um, Nikki? Um, yeah, so this question is first uh, for Diana and then anyone can answer. But um, how has corporate social responsibility influenced your, your perspective on diversity? Mm -hmm. That's an interesting question. So I don't know, I've been at this for almost 20 years, right? And um, it really hasn't changed much, right? We've we've done and until recently, until like the past few years, right? We've done a lot around, um, you know, having a group, a cultural diversity group within your team, and it's always the people of color, right? The ones like leading it. I always felt like I had to run, like raise my hand to be part of the group to educate everyone, but. At that time, I was in my early 20s. Like, what did I know about educating people about diversity, right? Um, and then I, I, I like the shift now of the, the difference between diversity and, and looking more at inclusion, right? Because you can still have a diverse team. And what makes a minority a minority, even, your, even if you're larger numbers, right, is the power that you have, the influence that you have, right? So the focus on inclusion over the last few years has been... Um, uh, pretty exciting to me because, and again, the difference between diversity, you have a diverse group versus like, I feel like I belong here. I feel comfortable here. Um, and so now being able to have pro programs to help people like they really truly belong, which to me, I feel like they will really truly perform for the company because they're invested and the company's invested in truly in them, right? Not just a color or a number. Um, to me, it's, it's, it's pretty exciting. And so I've tried to find different ways on to do this now. Um, uh, like Noel said, right now I'm in a point of my career where I do have some influence. So um, one key thing that I've done now, I do a lot of um, vendor assessments for like third party applications for my company to use, right? So um, I start to question and, and if it's really like head to head and we don't know which one to choose, right? I start to ask, well, what's your diversity and inclusion plan for your organization? Right. What does your executive or um, team look like and, and what's the plan there? And, and hopefully one day, right, that'll help us make those decisions. And right now it's not um, something that we do all the time. Right. Uh, we have been able to use that as a tool. And so hopefully we can, you know, continue to to then influence and challenge others, you know, in that way. So it, it's been it's been a little bit of a roller coaster, but I, I like I like where it's going now. Thank you. Does anyone else have any thoughts? Okay, Nick, uh, you can ask the next question. Yeah, uh, sure. Um, so this can be posed for anyone. Um, how would you talk about the values of diverse identity identities within the workplace and within your specific industry? Anyone can jump in. I can start this one. Sorry, I don't want to. I don't want to hog all the questions. Um, I, I think I'm in a, a unique place to answer this. Right when we're talking about diverse identities, right? I work at a growth equity firm where that's just a pretty fancy way to say we invest in companies. And you know, the reports that we've seen over the last few years is how much dramatically less 
um, these investment companies invest in uh, businesses that are either owned by women or owned by people of color. So within my firm, it's extremely valuable to have the right people making the right decisions so that the funds can go to those organizations. Um, so I hope to continue, continue to see a lot more of that from my firm. Great. Um, would anyone else like to add anything to that question? Yeah, I think the value of, of diverse perspectives and it, it's very relevant to technology. I'll tell you that uh, it's look at social media, right? Like the, the thing is for many, many years, um, we all like Twitter, Facebook, all the social media companies have been building amazing products and features and, and everything, but not necessarily always embracing all the different types of people and age groups and such when they're building products and designing and, and that becomes problems, that becomes challenges because we're not thinking like from a UX standpoint, like it's not just how cool something is and looks on a screen, but what's the usability of it as well? And have you tested it across with multiple age groups and multiple people and, and gotten full opinions from everyone? So like a hypothesis, right? To formulate everything and then come to a solution. So it is very, very important. It's not just you know, even diversity overall, it's not just race related. It's also, it could also be targeting a product or a function towards an older group versus a younger group. That's where you'll see things today, like a TikTok was very attractive with a lot of kids. And then you see, you know, Twitter is very attractive with like a lot of millennials. And then you see Facebook's very attractive for family oriented people and a lot of the older groups. And it just it continues that that way. And it, there's something you take out of all of it. So um, yeah, it is, it's a very interesting and fascinating kind of topic and go on for hours, uh, but you definitely should consider all of diversity. I mean, even if we think about AI, right? The future and, and how long we've been talking about AI. And if we have a lot of the same people building artificial intelligence, like we're really gonna be in trouble. Yeah. Very true. Um, anyone have anything else? No? Okay, um, well, I'll toss it back to Nikki. Um, so this question is for anyone. Um, if you have experienced imposter syndrome, how did you overcome it? It's a trick question. I don't think <laughs> I've overcome it yet. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll give a really short answer. I'd love to hear everyone else's opinion on this one because it's a very important, powerful topic for, um, and it's not, this isn't also a topic that's specific towards minorities, although it's more enhanced upon minorities and how we feel. Imposter syndrome is real and it never really fully goes away, no matter how successful you are or where you are in your career, even though you may think you're doing great or such, there's always going to be something. There's something you're going to doubt yourself on or something you're going to go into a new role, new place, new people and say, do I really belong here or not? Um, the way you, you, you challenge that is by literally taking some mental breathers and reminding yourself that you are here for a reason, like every single step of the way. There were times where when I was in college at Penn State, I didn't know like, you know, where am I going? Like, what am I going to do from here? Do I even belong? Am I even, you know, like, do I have the skill set to even succeed in technology? I had doubts about myself in consulting. Like, am I presenting well? Like, do people actually like me or not? Like, is there something I need to do differently? And I have now doubts today too. And in, in the tech industry, do I even belong here with the giants of all the tech people um, and the smartest engineers and all of that? But the truth is I do. And we all do, right? We, we're here for a reason. You get hired, you get scouted, you get, you know, you get an opportunity. It's not because you didn't deserve it. Someone believed in you, the hiring manager, the team, right? So you take that on with a grain of salt and you just make yourself realize I do belong here. I'm going to make it. And you constantly remind yourself through that um, for the rest of your life, because that's the only way uh, for you not to drive yourself crazy. Yeah, um, I guess just to tie on to Noelle, like it's something you never get over. Honestly, when I, 
I remember going to my new hire training when I first started and I was like, I, it was a lot of finance things because I do financial IT audits. Um, and I just remember being like, I don't understand finance at all. Like, what did I get myself into? Whoa. Like, and I felt my peers were miles ahead of me. Um, meanwhile, I was the one that kind of got like that early promotion, you know, and things like that, that just kind of proved that I was where I belonged. Um, and again, to Noelle's point, like, you know, just having those mentors that you can talk to and those, and those hiring managers that, you know, you, you believe they believe in you, um, people like that, you know, you really have to kind of, I don't want to say go back to, but almost go back to for kind of like that reassurance. Um, and again, just like to Noelle's point, I'm relatively new to my position as a senior. I was promoted in May. Um, so as right now, especially I'm having a lot of doubts. We're, pre we're getting pretty busy now at work. Um, and I'm just like, whoa, can I manage all of this? Like, do I, can I actually do it? You know, am I prepared for this? Um, and then I just kind of think back to, okay, well, you know, um, my counselor, my manager, my senior managers, like they wouldn't have nominated me um, for this role earlier if they had not believed that I couldn't do the work, right? Um, and then just another thing that I always do to kind of help myself is just ask, you know, just nonchalantly kind of general coffee chats, mainly for feedback then. Um, when I first started in this role, I went to one of my managers and I was like, I feel like I'm doing awful. Like, I'm so sorry. The work I'm giving you is probably not my best. Like, do you have any feedback for me? And she was like, honestly, you're doing really great. I'm very impressed. Right. So that type of reassurance and things like that really just kind of helps you kind of overcome um, the imposter syndrome for sure. Yeah, I agree with, with everything that Noel and Jackie said. I would also tack on to what Jackie said is um, whatever it is that you're doing next, don't go into it completely blind, right? That whatever that next endeavor is, it attracted you for a reason. And so the more you know about it, the more you study about it, the less of an imposter you become, uh, you know, the less of a student and learning mode to more of like contribution mode. And then that's when you know, all right, I got over the hump. Now it's like on to the next thing. Thank you. Yeah, that's like definitely something that I've like heard people struggle with and I personally struggle with. So that was great advice. Um, so we are nearing the end. Um, do you ha guys have any additional thoughts that you'd like to share? No, I'll just say, I'm just continue to network. Um, and put yourself out there because the more comfortable you are with being uncomfortable, like you're going to go like so many great places and you're going to have so many opportunities and just be comfortable with no, right? And be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, this is definitely the college to be in, like for sure. I remember when I was in school, I had a lot of friends and, and no shame at all the amazing colleges at Penn State, but a lot of friends who were in finance, they were in SNEELs, uh, they were aerospace engineering, like all types of different majors. And looking back into my network, like I right now, and a lot of ISC students and alumni that I've worked with in, as well from this college are doing just as much, if not better than a lot of the other majors. And I say that in a nice way because IST is enormous. It's not just the programming skills you get, it's the soft skills. It translates very, very well for many different career paths in security, also in consulting, and then also in strategy and operations uh, within the tech space which are very high coveted roles that a lot of the top companies are hiring for. So, um, and I just want to leave everyone with saying you made the right choice. Like this is an amazing program to be a part of. And even if it seems down or, you know, you're having a bad day or this, or it seems difficult, it, it IST is enormous. Like take advantage of the alumni network that we have. You, I've worked with so many people who came from IST across reach out to them, talk to us, uh, see how we can help give you more perspectives and start reaching out now. You never know, right? You find yourself a mentor. Like we, you know, we always look for that as well and we can help out in any way. So uh, be very excited for uh, the future. Yeah, and then just to add on there, um, I would say, you know, take all of the opportunities IST gives you 
And also look for your um, support network also within the IC, not only your peers, but faculty and staff, they're definitely there for you. Um, I remember relying heavily on Rita and Olivia Lewis, who was in the Office of um, Diversity and Inclusion at the time, right? So all of those people really did influence and impacted um, you know, where I am today. Thank you all. Um, Nick? Yeah, thank you all for imparting that wisdom. I think a lot of that applies now to our demographic of students. So it's very helpful. And I appreciate you sharing that for students that may be going through those same, you know, barriers right now. Um, so thank you again for all our panelists for participating, for our attendees for um, visiting today. And again, for the panelists who have really paved the way for the audience today. Thank you. Um, for our audience, um, please look for more information on future identity talks on our uh, College of IST website. Our next one is on LGBTQ plus alumni pride, which is being held on October 6th. Thank you again and have a good day. Thanks for having us. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.